Good morning, everybody. Let's start with an experiment. So I want you to try something out. And remember what happens. And we'll pick it up at the end. So everybody try this. Take your hands out and clap them together real big loud. Now, think about this for a moment and that sound. How long does it last? How long will you remember that sound? Now hold these thoughts and we'll come back to it at the end. You know, hopefully it will make sense. So, for the message today, you ever have those times when it seems like whatever you do doesn't amount to a hill of beans? I've had that experience lately at work. For the last several months, work has been crazy. On top of the quote, regularly scheduled programming, so to speak, there's a big project. I've been working on it. Can we not busy nights, weekends, most days through lunch and dinner? Brother Carlos, he was awesome enough to, to cover for me one weekend. I wasn't even sure I was going to be here on that Sunday, that Wednesday. Thank you, Brother Carlos. I was working something I thought that, that counted. I thought it mattered. We were going to dig in, do the hard work, have the facts, have the numbers, really solid ground to base the recommendations on. And we did. It culminated in hundreds of slides, days of presentations, some really substantial recommendations. I thought I was going to change some, some really big initiatives, the direction of them. Guess how much effect it actually had? Kathy's got it. Zero. Zip, nada, bubkas. Nothing. Guess how happy I was about that. <laughs> you can ask my wife how it was after work some days. But all that work, all that time, all that effort didn't give me anything. A few weeks down the road, I'm not even sure anybody's going to remember it. And honestly, that's probably what I should be doing too. But this got me to thinking. And hopefully I'll, this will make sense. But let's dig in. And hopefully this will help someone else too if this ever happens to them. I don't think I'm the only one who's had that happen. But let's start with verse 1 of Matthew 15. And we're going to actually going to spend most of the time here in Matthew 15. So if you've got your Bibles with you, feel free to... Mark your page here, keep your finger on it. Matthew 15 starts with 15, verse 1 and 2. And the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. They're asking Jesus, Hey, why don't your guys wash their hands? What's going on here? And the scribes and Pharisees ask him more than about Tradition than cleanliness. And Jesus corrects them on that. And there's a lot to say about that. But let's skip down a few verses and pick back up on the hand washing. Let's pick up in verse 10, if you don't mind. So Matthew 15, starting in verse 10. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes in the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. And that's weird, right? I mean, if you think about it, you don't wash your hands, you don't keep a clean kitchen, you get sick. Clear and simple. Today, you can look around the auditorium. Everybody here is wearing a mask. We know what goes in can make you sick. So, what was Jesus talking about? We all to understand this very simple premise. However, Jesus is just brushing it aside. Like it doesn't even matter. Notice what Jesus is focused on. He's focused on what defiles a person. If you get sick, does that damage your soul? No. Not at all. It may damage your body, so we still don't want to do it. What physically happens to this meat suit of our soul won't damage or affect it. Notice how Jesus is focused on defiling. To defile something is to make it ceremonially unclean, unholy. What's so bad about being ceremonially unclean or unholy? Can't tell you fucking some ceremony? Who cares, right? Why is Jesus so focused on this? Well, what ceremony would this defiled person not be able to attend? They could not partake in the services to worship the God in Jewish time. If a priest, they couldn't take part in activities they're supposed to do in the service of God. 
it separated that person from their time and their service to God. It put space in between the creation and the creator by the creation's work. Now that's the big deal. Let's read on to the next verse. Verse 12. And his disciples came to him and said to him, Do you know the Pharisees were offended when you heard this saying? Uh oh. The Pharisees, they're, 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 they're down at living. They're so upset. They're, they're down at offended. Jesus, how could you? You upset them. Let's see what Jesus says in response. 13 and 14. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Since what Jesus is saying is, and? I'm supposed to be upset at this? How? Blind leading the blind, and both fall into a ditch. This is where this famous saying comes from. The disciples are saying the Pharisees are just livid and offended by Jesus. They're saying, how dare he not bow to us in our, our something trivial? I can't believe he's flaunting our, our ridiculous demand. Why would he do that? Now, this is Jesus, and he's God in human form. So it's probably easy for him to brush something off like this, right? What about us? If this happens to us. Now, for me, I don't like it when someone gets upset at what I say. I want the other person to like me. I want them to agree with me, to value what I've said or done. It's uncomfortable when I can tell someone isn't agreeing with me or is against what I'm saying. I mean, it's for everybody. In fact, you ever have that urge to fight, to change, to accommodate what you're saying to make them happy? Well, if you do change, guess who isn't happy at that point? Yeah, you, me. If I trade in what I know and what I think what someone else has said, that's not so good. And this gets amped up when it's someone important. Imagine if your boss is making faces when you're talking, they're talking on a phone call instead of listening to you. That kind of bugs me. It gets under my skin. But if you look here, Jesus is actually telling us how to deal with that. Look closely at what he's saying. Let's reread this slide again. Matthew 15, 13, and 14. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. What matters? It isn't pleasing the other person. It's not even on the radar right here. It's not being cold or callous either. But, what, but it is recognizing the situation for what it is. What Jesus is saying is, recognize what is right. If you're speaking what God wants you to, you will remain rooted. Those that are not speaking the truth and what comes from God will be removed. The one who's not the right will be known in due time. If you've been to please someone who's wrong, then you're wrong. If the train is crashing, you're on a train, you're riding down the track, clickety clack, clickety clack, and you see that it's about to crash into something, and you go, hey, whoa, 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 it's about to crash. But the conductor comes up to you and goes, no, 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 we're all okay. Go ahead and triple your ass. What do you do? If you, A, go, oh, okay, and go back and take your seat. Or do you, B, you need one of the others and start looking for some soft landing spot to jump off of so you don't get found up in the trash. If it is A, then you'll have a nice, calm train ride. No mean looks, no snide remarks, all the way into the rubble of the crash site. And all of you will end up in the same place. If it's B, then you get the conductor pretty angry at you. As well as those who are trying to butter up to the conductor. Your life is not going to be easy during that time. But if you, as long as you get off that train, then you get to survive and not go down into the crash. In this moment, if Jesus had worried about pleasing these wealthy and influential dudes, and going, oh, my bad. Guys, these guys over here are better than God. What would we have thought about Jesus? Well, 
One, he wouldn't be Jesus because he just denied himself. And we would all be in for a huge amount of trouble because well, he's our only hope. Those Pharisee dudes are long gone. No one knows them, remembers the name. We all know Jesus. We all know God. In that moment, if Jesus had bowed to the pressure of pleasing those other guys, that would have ruined our salvation. The Lord's Supper we just protect of wouldn't have meant anything, right? But it does. For us, when we're in those situations, we don't have quite as high stakes as the whole world on our shoulders. But, think about this. Every time that we deny what is right, what is correct, what we know to be true, be someone else, we lose a little bit of ourselves. And that doesn't mean to be so hard-headed that we don't ever listen to truth. We don't ever listen to reason. But it does mean that we know we're right. We know the truth. We know God's on our side. We're worried about what God thinks, not what man thinks. That ditch that they will fall into, the wrong path, an unsuccessful initiative. Also the grave. Because if you think about it, every human being has a limited shelf life that expires. God has no expiration date. In Hebrew, his name Jehovah, or Yahweh, and translates into the existing one. He has always been, and he always will be. He's our reference. He's who we have to worry about pleasing. We're talking to someone who doesn't know God. God is strange. Odd. First. They're talking, trying to talk you out of it. See where they're trying to get mercy in. That's kind of what's happening here with these Pharisees. What Jesus is saying is so foreign to these Pharisees. They're trying to move the needle back to where they're at. And it's more comfortable if they move that back to where they're at. But our job is to get folks to see things from God's point of view. See, in respect of the true God who loves us, who cares about us. He gave his son to die for us. That's powerful. And the perspective of God who loves us is way better than the perspective of us crazy humans who are just trying to make our way to this world. Those conversations are not going to be comfortable. And we can't bend the truth to please someone if it denies what is true and what God says. We need to follow the example of Jesus. Stand firm when there's pressure to bend the compromise, because there will be. If we've been a compromise, we forfeit our chance at salvation and potentially theirs too. So in that macrocosm of things, it's kind of the same stakes as Jesus, just at a very small scale. Your salvation, their salvation. Let's keep looking at these verses. Turn down to 15. Matthew 15, 15 through 20. And we're going to read the first three verses here, 15, 16, 17, and we'll come back to Matthew 20. Matthew 15. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not understand whatever enters the mouth goes in the stomach and is eliminated? Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile men. Now, let's pause for a moment and make this very clear, because this is kind of interesting. What Jesus, God Almighty in human form, is saying here, it doesn't matter what you pull out your booty. It matters what you spew out of your mouth. <laughs> Don't worry about the pew, the poo. Worry about the spew. Let's read on and see why. In verse 19 and 20. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. When we do these things, when we know our heart produces evil worships to good, that makes us unclean. That separates us from God. Now, killing somebody, stealing, lying, all those other things we're talking about here, those are relationships with others, with fellow human beings. It's not good, not what we should do. Kind of like not washing our hands can make us sick. These actions can make our relationships sick. It's pretty easy to see that. But notice, Jesus doesn't even focus on that. There is something more important, something so foundational that it comes before all of that. And that 
is our relationship to God. That's our foundation. And that's what Jesus is focusing on. God loves us. He wants what's best for us. And he's not want our physical bodies to get sick. He's in, we encourage to take care of them, to be healthy. He doesn't want relationships with fellow humans to be sick. We encourage to love each other. Jesus knew that getting ourselves right with God was the foundation for everything else. And it's it's the foundation of everything that should be important in our lives. And that is why he focused on the problem and separating ourselves from God. The same way our actions drive a wedge between us and others is the same way they drive a wedge between us and God. In our works, the things we do, in our lives, what do we focus on? Where do we put our attention? In this very visceral world we live in, things you touch, things you feel, things you ingest to drink, that's very easy to focus on those, right? They're here. It's visceral. It's physical. You can see it. You can tell it. You can smell it. You can touch it. It's so very easy to focus on those things that we do, right? That we have. It's right here in front of us. All around us. It's what we live in. So it's very easy for that to take front and center in our lives. It's really hard to focus on what's beyond this. However, there are times in our lives when God sends us messages that lets us learn things on our own. The story I started with today, the fun I was having at work. The world and these things, this world, will never fail to disappoint you. It's guaranteed. And all that work, all that effort, all that time lost, basically big smack in the head saying, hey, that's not what's important. That's not what you should be doing. Because no matter how much time you spend on things in this world, it all passes. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is about that. Vanity of vanities. This world will never pay you back like God does. It will always let you down. But God never will let you down. We are here for God. For our turn with Him. For our service to Him. For our love of Him. And for His love of us. Worrying about things in this world consumes way too much time. And that precious time is speeding by what seems like a million miles an hour. At the very beginning of this, I asked everyone to clap. I mean, even remember that. Think back to that moment. Can you get that clap back? Can you undo it? Can you take that sound back and make it not happen? No. It is long gone with the flow of time. And our lives are just like that. Our lives are rushing by. Our eternity lays ahead. And this life goes by so quick. This is the reason Jesus focused on what matters and what could separate us from God. We want a life with God who is loved to be our eternity. Being without God, without love, without a creator, terrifying. Forget the fire and brimstone you hear in those sermons. Trying to be without love, without the source of that love, that's what's truly horrifying. The true terror is being away from God. Return. We have moments to talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. Talk to someone. Tell them about God, about his love, about how great it is to live with him. Walk with him, spend time with him, sing to him. You should never let those moments get by. Because you never get them back. You never get a chance to take it back. Just let that clap that is gone in a moment. You may get another chance, but you never get that first chance back. In this life, as you go throughout it, make sure what you're doing matters. Make sure that what you're doing is in the service of God. Because if it is not, you can be guaranteed that it does not matter. And it will not satisfy you. As we go about our lives, remember not to worry about the poo, worry about your spew. Let your heart 
right with God. Make sure you don't worry about things that will separate you from God. Make sure your heart is true in love, life, God's words, thoughts centered on God. That's what's important. That's what we got to do. And that is the short lesson for today. If there's any money you do prayers, the congregation, need the anything that we can do for you. Anybody who'd like to join God's family, join his love, spend time with him, please let us know as we stand and sing the invitation song.